start by congratulating you. You seem to have picked up at least two Cromwell Awards in the last two weeks. Yeah. You've got uh, the TFCA, the Toronto Film Critics Association. Yeah. And uh, well, I guess it's not an award, but Adam Manley telling saying that you're the best uh, filmmaker in Toronto is a pretty high honor. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, what are you looking to do with the, uh, the money you received for, for the uh, TFCA? Do you already have a plan for that? Um, I got $5,000 and it was the J. Scott Prize, okay. so that was really a huge honor because J. Scott you know, was an incredible support of independent cinema. And um, $5,000 is going right into my next feature film. So I deposited the check today, <laughs> and I'm going to transfer it into an ING savings account, and I'm going to sort of put it on a stove like Jiffy Pop popcorn and hope that it seeds more. and. Um, I'm hoping to raise maybe fifty thousand dollars for my next feature. And how does this compare to like your your approaches to raising money for your previous features? For my previous features, well, I'm a good person. I'm a bad person. I finance totally myself with credit cards, so it's a, a bit tempting to put the five thousand dollars towards paying off some of my debt. But I'm not going to do that. Um, and. Uh, Modra, I financed the production myself and then I received money from Telephone Canada through the Low Budget Independent Feature Film Program, which is an amazing director-driven program. And only I split the cost with my co-director, Simon Reynolds. So I have pretty much everything I've directed, I have paid for myself. Like from the shorts to the features. And is that something you, you value in the sense that it gives you a creative control or is it something you kind of slowly want to move away from when you can? Yeah, I guess I, I don't want it, I can't keep funding my films, but at the same time I'm impatient and I don't want to wait for permission to make the films or wait for everything to be in place. So if I get the fire to make a film, I just have to do it. I mean, I just have to do it if, if there's people around that are with me and, um, and things are sort of in place and the project feels ready, I'm going to do it whether I have received money from outside sources or whether I have to pay for it myself. I just, uh, yeah, I just can't wait. Now that you've, you've got three three features completed, um, looking back, is there anything you've noticed about beyond the production process, your own just creative drive that you pick out as being similar in each or the each evolution of the last? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess they're similar in that I, I like to work from a personal place. I mean, I work a lot from my own experience mixed with things that I imagine only was set in the motel where I actually lived for three or four years of my life. And I cleaned those motel rooms and I worked the switchboard and it was an incredibly lonely time for me. So I wanted to capture that age of 12 when my son was 12. So I'm working with my son. I'm working in a location that's really familiar to me. Um, and it comes from a personal place. Modra, similarly, I'm working with my daughter in the village in Slovakia where my mother was born and all my relatives live there and they're people I'm sort of estranged from, I don't really know them and so through the film I, I wanted to get to know my family more and so that's also really personal. And uh, I am a good person, I'm a bad person came out of being on the festival circuit with Modra and it being really tough sometimes. I mean, I. I'm really motivated by film festivals. I love the community and the environment of film festivals and seeing works of other people from other countries and being a part of something. But at the same time, it's um, it can be just really lonely and uh, and I don't know. Somehow you're part of a community and you feel alienated at the same time and um, you can doubt yourself and. Sometimes nobody's at your screenings or there's no questions at the Q&A and 
Q and A, and and it's a it's an interesting sort of ride. So being at film festivals with my daughter um, and going through all these different experiences triggered I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, which we made while we were at film festivals. So right after Modra screened in Bradford, I asked the audience if they would stick around for half an hour to be part of I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, and I threw out the penis movie and nobody knew what they were going to be watching and you know I had some actors planted in the audience but everywhere everywhere we were going with Modra I kind of incorporated into I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. So it's personal. So when the critics like it, um, it feels really great because it means that it'll get to an audience and people will maybe um, have a chance to see the film and when they don't like it, it's very personal and it means that the film probably won't really have a life beyond the film festivals. So, so the award is really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if it's sourced so much from um, personal experiences, do you carry around images when you're experiencing these things? That you, not, not even just specific shots, but even kind of locations or how to represent those locations? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I've been to Berlin six times, and uh, I definitely am always clocking things, but I'm not clocking people or locations or images in the everyday so much, but when I turn my sights towards making a film, I'm really, I, everything's really heightened to me. And everybody I'm seeing on the subways or everybody, every place, all the time, is fodder for the creative. So I'm not always in that state because I, you know, it's you're really exposed and vulnerable in that state. But when I'm there, um, it's really exciting. I'm kind of addi addicted in a way to that to that zone. So when I knew I was going to make I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, and then and then of course I started thinking about about Berlin. I started thinking about specific locations the hostels I stayed in doing the Berlin Alley Talent Lab or certain locations on the street and um, you know the Brandenburg Gate and the the, the monument to all the, the Jew, Jews murdered. Um, I, I really wanted to set scenes in those places but Bradford um, I'd never been to before so I was Google searching things and I was looking at um, where the festival was and were, was there going to be a park nearby and similarly with Paris I'd only been there once when I was pregnant with my daughter so I was Google searching places so I'm writing for locations I've never seen before. For only and I kind of just want to segue specifically to talk about only for a little bit um, one thing that struck me is kind of the whiteness of everything both the snow and kind of also how the camera is uh, deals with light specifically from a, a window from the inside um, how much is that a technical limitation, or how much is it um, a formal decision that's being made? Um, with only in the snow, well it was the snow was starting to thaw, it was kind of the transition into spring, so that was really intentional in terms of the transition between the state of being a child and being a teenager. So everything in the natural world was in a state of flux, so that was really intentional. But also, I really have strong memories of being um, up there in, near Perry Sound at that motel during the holidays, which was often like either summer holidays, Christmas holidays, March break. Um, and somehow that March break time, which was, was exactly when we shot, uh, stuck out the most for me. But really, it was more of a practical thing because the kids had no school, um, it was feasible, all of those things. So one affects the other like in terms of do the creative impulses determine things or do the limitations and restrictions determine the creative it's a it's an interplay between those two things for me all the time my money and my time will dictate what i end up writing i'm writing to extreme limitations all the time i don't just write whatever comes um in a sort of total fantasy imaginary way, I am writing towards what I can actually execute all the time. So with my new script, if I have an idea that I don't think I can execute, I don't, I don't write it. Um, how do you feel about the kind of pigeonholing that happens with Mumblecore as like a lineage that you're put into with, with the start? It seemed to start with only, but certainly with Modra. 
and it kind of maybe tapered off a bit with I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. Well, I think Mumblecore is here, and I think Adam Maywin has said I'm Humblecore, so I think I'm like here. <laughs> um, I think the Mumblecores have more money than I do, and uh, I don't know, I, I appreciate a lot of those films. They're very naturalistic. I really like naturalism, and I like working with professional and non-professional actors. I like the process of making a fiction um, using a documentary model with a crew of two, just camera and sound having incredible flexibility but starting with a strong foundation. Very little um, in my films is actually improvised in terms of dialogue, but I like to have the freedom to be spontaneous. So I like, I like all of that stuff that comes with low budget. Um, if I had more money, the, I don't think my crew size would increase and I don't know if um, my films would necessarily become that much more ambitious. I think I would just pay fewer people more money. So I'd love to pay everyone, you know, a $10,000 flat to work with me. I would love that as opposed to like a $2,000 flat or on only it was a $100 flat. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, so I'm working with people who either want a feature film credit because they've just come out of school or they're really experienced and they want to have a different kind of filmmaking adventure. But I don't, I, Pigeon, like I don't pigeonhole myself, and if it's a if it's a way to get more people to see the work because they identify or they the label makes them interested, yeah, cool. I have no problem with it. What was the decision behind uh, having the sets of parents be played by the same people? Well, I really always wanted to do that because I know Simon as an actor from way, way back and I like the idea of, uh, I mean, there was something in the script about, you know, do we choose our parents and ultimately does it really matter what parents we have, like the whole nature-nurture question, would she, would that girl, Vera, um, played by Elena hutchins -Lyle, would she be who she is regardless of who, 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 who her parents were. So I like the idea of them both having the same parents and yet being who they are. And the parents are physically different, but maybe they're not that different, actually. So it was um, thematically interesting to me. And I, it was also really practical because we were up there and we could then inject some parent scenes whenever it was good, whenever the kids needed a break or something like that. I guess what's interesting to me is that there, it's a it's a film that's limited in its locations, right? It's specifically from yeah. the concept of it being at this motel, and there's not really a rhyme or reason to how it seemingly presented when it's at the motel. But it's very insistent when they leave because you get a set of shots of them leaving and yeah. the path they take. Yeah. And then when they have to return eventually, which they have to do because their, their parents are yeah. they know where they are, you get the exact mirror. And it seems like in a, in a film that, as you mentioned, is kind of spontaneous to some extent, even though it's, it's written specifically, the, the script is, is very specific, that this is one moment where you have a clear, uh, the form almost comes more to the front because you're, you're recognizing that you're witnessing the exact same sequence of shots in reverse as they go back. No, I mean, it's not so into heady. Mm -hmm. It's more like you go on a journey and then the Hansel and Gretel thing, yeah, yeah. you follow your way back yeah. with breadcrumbs or whatever. Um, and there's a cycle and the d days are in cycles and the sun comes up and the sun goes down and just that they deviate from the path and discover the ruins as a magical thing um, is something that happens when you go on excursions if you're open and you're receptive to those unknown moments, you know. Um, and I love traveling and sort of having a destination, like, uh, you know, Daniel in the film, played by my son Jacob, he wants to show her the things he knows, and he's sort of in control, and then there's a point in which he deviates from what he even knows, and they discover something together. And that is sort of magical, like when you're traveling with someone, and you're, you know, I've been to New York, I lived in New York for two years, and I'm gonna show someone New York, and then we just go left instead of right. And then, you know, it goes into questions of 
destiny and fate, and are we destined to be together? And are you, were you des was it destined that your mother leave and that you were stranded here? And we've now had this magical experience um, that I could have never anticipated if I'd stuck to the plan. So they share this one day, and I don't think I didn't want to overthink it to be honest because. When I'm writing and when I'm making a film, maybe it's because of my acting background, I am, I, I'm very much in the state of the characters and I didn't want to overthink it because I wanted to discover with them. And I wanted there to be um, something innocent about that, you know? So, so something like Jacob proposing the scene in the basketball court, that was perfect. That's, that was the essence of that time in my life when I was 12 and the essence of making that film was following his impulse to do a scene in the basketball court as opposed to stick to the plan of going to the Bobby Orr Community Center. So, yeah, I mean, whether it's sometimes, you know, in, in t doing interviews or doing Q&As, I become conscious of a lot of things that I wasn't conscious of making the film and I don't really want to become conscious of why I'm doing certain things because it saddens me in a way it's like it takes the magic away from the process I don't want to understand why I'm doing certain things I really don't I resist it so much um, even in working with my crew my cinematographer when I'm sort of asked to explain certain choices I don't want to and I think it's some it's it's a danger in the funding systems where you have to overly articulate why you want to do certain things and how you want to do them because I don't want to execute a predetermined plan. It's the most boring thing I can imagine that I'm making a script, I write a script and everybody agrees and we storyboard it and we shot list it and everything's all predetermined and then we just simply go out and execute that a la Hitchcock or whatever. I want to have a rough map that's the minimum the film will be. It's like the very last resort what everybody thinks the film will be is the minimum, but I want to lift off from that. So when you ask me the questions you're asking me, I, I, don't, I don't even really want to answer that. Uh -huh. um, is that something, though, that can happen, maybe not in the pre-production process or even the planning process, but certainly in the editing, when you choose to kind of develop maybe a motif that maybe has no rationale behind it, but it becomes one nonetheless, and maybe we could talk about Modra in that sense with its motif of the, the profile shots of the, the residents of the town. My family. Yeah. Yeah, well something like that, um, the portraits, mm -hmm. are was really in the script because, and I remember showing rough cuts of that film just to a few people and everyone was taken, taken out of the film by those portraits and there was not one person that said keep the portraits. Everyone huh. was saying cut the portraits um, because it was a bit of a sideways move, but it was one of the very first things I wrote when I started writing the script were these portraits and it came from really uh, only knowing my family through photo album pictures so when I met a family member in real life I would flash to the image of them in the photo album so I thought when Lena my daughter is meeting her family for the first time we meet them through her perspective which is really a portrait image with them looking directly into the camera. So that was really something that was, that started the whole script going. And it begins the film, does it not? Like one of those is the, the beginning. And I think that maybe why some people might have found it takes them out is because it's, uh, the sound is, uh, is asynchronous to it as well. Right. At the beginning. So yeah. So it, it begins with a kind of confusion, I guess, both on who these people are and by uh, an extension of that, where they are. Yeah. Well, one of the very first shots is a portrait of her. Yeah. So we come to know her in this sort of naked way. And then, you know, we have this journey with her. And then through her, we meet the family who she's meeting for the first time through these portraits. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was really important to me. And also just to see, I just, you know, this, that film was as much for, you know, me and my daughter and my Slovak family and capturing them in a kind of romantic way, the way I want my family to be, more than the way they really are. Um, and having something that my daughter could show to her grandkids. So in that way, I really wanted to have these images where they're just really openly looking in the camera. 
it wasn't really so int I, I didn't I didn't really understand how it weaved its how how it was going to work narratively, but I knew it was just really important personally. Well, it creates a theme I found of a kind of familiarity or um, an alienness that the like a back and forth between the two that I I, th I also noticed prominently in those shots of the speaker, like the communication system that exists right. in the town, where it's it's deliberately not subtitled for like the first two times, so you really have to confront the fact that you don't know what's going on, but then when it finally does get explained in the film, it's explained as, oh, this is a Modra thing, so it's almost explicit at that point that this is a local thing, and you kind of become aware for most audiences that you're not local to that space. Right. So, yeah, and also is there a, haunt, a haunting echo of, you know, other times, Soviet times or whatever, where maybe what was coming through those speakers was really intense news, because I liked that too, and really, again, I hadn't, I hadn't written that, that, those announcements blared through the system, those speakers, six times a day, at really uh, random times, and they just announced the most banal things, um, but they constantly were interrupting our shooting. So we would have to stop recording sound because the dialogue scenes or whatever was going to work. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to work around these announcements. I'm going to incorporate the announcements. So there is that documentary moment when, uh, and it was odd to keep it in the film, but I really liked it. My daughter is visiting her great aunt, who's my grandfather's sister. She's 98 years old. She's just finished shoot, uh, singing the song, my cousin on clarinet. And then the announcements start. And the announcements interrupt that scene. And we just hold on my daughter's character, and really that was, we were all in pause. So if, I really like, that film is so much in between a docu-fiction, because it's my real family again, and so many things are real, and absolutely so many things are made up. But in that moment, it's like you can see my daughter shift between her character of Lena into herself as she as we're all just waiting for the announcements to end before we can continue shooting. And uh, I really love the suspension of that in-between moment, you know? So, um, yeah, ultimately we sort of explained those announcements, but I like that they're both, they're haunting, they were really happening, and, uh, and, and the humor, you know, because I think they're kind of hilarious, really because they do announce um, someone left their parking, their keys in the parking lot and stuff like that. And, and with the music, your selection of the music for, for this film, I'm thinking specifically kind of the almost country western sounding music, but that's obviously delivered in a local language. Um, how that might be something that audiences respond to because there is a familiarity in the sound, but maybe obviously not the, the lyrics. Um, and then that matched with the like electronic dance music that happens when they leave Mondra. Right. Well, that's my uncle's band. He's like the Neil Young of Slovakia. Um, you know, that band's been together for over 30 years. They're superstars there. Literally, people sing their songs around campfires. They were on the radio all the time. We were shooting at the club and bars and whatever. The songs were coming on the radio. Um, they perform almost every weekend. So, you know, it's my uncle. So he gave me all his music, and there's about 30 albums. Um, so that, of course, was a really important element of the soundtrack. And close to the end of our shoot, um, a 72-hour music festival swooped in on that village. Huh. And 10,000 people, the, the village is populated with maybe 8,000. And 10,000 people came in from all over Slovakia and camped on the lawns of every single house nearby to attend this um, music festival which went 24 hours for three days and it was everything it was like crazy like hardcore metal punk hip-hop electronic music um a ton like i don't know 50 live bands or something and lots of djs and it was a completely insane environment <laughs> Um, I've never seen so many passed out people in piles in a field before and it was fantastic and we actually shot a lot but the last scene when they're dancing was the moment we saved from that shoot and the band that plays Nitty Litty, mm -hmm. um, they're a band from the Czech Republic, they were performing at, at the festival and I love them and so I just asked if we could use that track. So that, was, that came from that place. 
as opposed to only was music that I really liked that I injected into the world, all the music in Modric came of the world. Was there any, anyone else at that festival that you had used? Um, that you enjoyed? Yeah, there was, a, there was a few other bands that I really liked. I don't know what they're called, but I have a lot of images, <laughs> images of them. Um, but Mitty Liddy stood out. And actually, Mitty Liddy at TIFF in 2011, um, they, I think, did a really good live score to a film that screened. And so they're going to get around. They're a really interesting trio. So we've talked about um, you know, your relationship with your family, um, but when that comes into I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, because you're using your daughter, again, specifically in a prominent role, there also is kind of an inner text that, that gets created, because if you've seen Modra, you're aware of a different character, but also with most of the press surrounding you, you're probably also aware that she's your daughter. How did you approach that in the, in the casting of I'm a good person, I'm a bad person? Well. A lot of things sort of culminate and I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. You know, my son from Only plays my son. On Skype, right? Yeah, yeah. on Skype and he's in the first scene too when he's interrupting the blowjob. <laughs> and uh, my daughter, you know, from Modra is playing my daughter and I'm the filmmaker behind Only in Modra. And the magician in Modra, yeah, who's yeah. silent the whole movie, actually is an actor from Paris, and he appears, and I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. So a lot of things kind of culminate. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I wanted to play with the, I really wanted to play with those layers inside other layers inside other layers, and I'm actually going to do an interview later, and I thought I would do it as Ruby. Uh -huh. And when I started to think of doing it as Ruby, because people always ask me how autobiographical the film is, when I started to think of doing it as Ruby, it's, it's completely different. I mean, she's completely different. Um, I don't think she's ever had a good review in her life, <laughs> although she really, really hopes to get one. And um, it was hard to be in that. It was really that Making I'm a good person, I'm a bad person is probably the most terrified I've ever been going into a film. And the most excited. I had absolutely no idea if that film would work. Um, I just wanted to take all kinds of chances creatively and sort of push myself. And I guess because I paid for it all, if it was a complete disaster, um, I could just show it to my daughter and my friends and that would be the end of it. You know, So there, there's that too when you self-finance. That, first of all, I think people have very low expectations. You keep people's expectations very low. And then you have a chance to actually surprise and deliver something unexpected. But that film was um, completely insane. Well, I'm interested that people always want to ask about the autobio uh, autobiographical elements of it because one thing I noticed from the, the blowjob scene is in the background there's this director's chair that looks like it's a gift from the kids or something, like whether it was handmade. Yeah. And what that made me realize throughout the entire film is that the one thing that's never shown is that any actual directing. Like for something that's about a director, you're really not seeing any of the craft. You're seeing more of just the promotion or the, the obligations even. Well, she kind of bosses her daughter. Yeah, around. kind of, yeah. She's yeah. kind of directing her daughter um, in a kind of pathetic attempt to have some kind of control. I got the big bed. Hey, hey, hey. No, move over. But yeah, I imagine that red director's chair, it's cool that you notice things like that. See, I'm much more, I can really talk about this movie in a much more <laughs> articulate way. Uh, it's only last year. So, I imagine that she bought that director's chair for herself. Oh, really? Yeah. And that, but her name, of course, would never be on it. So she sort of directed her kids to <laughs> tape her name on the chair. Um, and she would sort of imagine herself on a set where she had a chair with her name on it. But Simon, who played the fathers in Only, plays the husband, and I'm just, that's like another a nice loop around. Of course, it had to be him. But he agreed to be in the film without knowing what that scene was going to be. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, I like that. You know, people that don't really ask too many questions just say yes and dive in. There was a, a quick story I heard about Lars von Trier interviewing a DP, and uh, there was a meeting place, um, and it was a 
whatever, the, the DP went to the location for the, for the interview and there was a note saying um, go to the beach and then directions to the beach and then at the beach there was a sign that said jump in. <laughs> that was the interview. And is that what you're kind of expecting out of the people that work with you? Yeah. I really expect people to just jump in. That's a lot to expect, isn't it? Um, yeah, I really, uh, I'm up for the adventure of it, you know, and I, I do think, I mean, I'm, I do try to answer everyone's questions and, but I want them, I want to hold on to the mystery and the discovery and, and all of that part of the process and the not knowing and the risking failure. And I guess low budget affords me that and I think I'm, I started step by step, I took on as much as I thought I could, you know, I, I acted for a really long time and then I started producing and I produced for 12 years a lot of other people's work and I, when I started directing I was doing a lot of co-directing and, and then I just very gradually moved into directing myself and it's been a 30 year journey and I am, I'm, I'm sort of cautious in that I want to do what I feel I'm sort of ready for but at the same time, I want to always take really, really big risks. And I don't know if I could do the films with the same, to the same, with the same degree of freedom if I'm getting money from, a lot of money from other people. It's too much of a responsibility for me. Then I think I would become very aware of the result and I would be very keen on the result working. Um, the product sort of being successful in the marketplace or whatever, whereas the way I've made only, um, which I co-directed with Simon Reynolds, Modra, and I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, is I have no idea these films are going to work. I'm just going to try and do something that is as truthful as possible. And if it catches fire, then I'll react to that. Like now I think I'm going to self-distribute, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. But it had to start with getting into the Toronto Film Festival. Had it not got into the Toronto International Film Festival, we wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> is he possessed? Sorry? Is the seat taken? No, sorry, no. I'm Yoni. Hi, I'm Ruby. Good evening, Ruby. So, where are you from? Um, Toronto. Canada. I love Canada. I have a friend in Vancouver. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, it's a very big country. That's true. Yeah. I really like your hair. Thanks. Can I touch it? Was there ever a point where you um, felt that, you know, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, that the form of, of the film would reflect how Ruby would direct something? Um, or at the very least, was it even something, a tension between yourself and how you want to do things and how, because you, you've written this script and you're probably considering how this person behaves. Five minutes left. Yeah. Five minutes. He's got five minutes left on his camera. Um, yeah, uh, okay, short answer. It was constantly a battle between myself having a kind of a meta perspective of yeah. the film and Ruby, that is, I think, extremely nearsighted um, and very self-absorbed. So it was, a, it was a, a very schizophrenic experience and I relied heavily on my um, DP, Benjamin Lichty, uh, because I would frequently, especially when I was wearing the sign, just go into a space and anything could happen. And, you know, a moment like at the Brandenburg Gate when I'm just kneeling down and then I decide to get up and walk and he's on a really long lens and the German soldier hugs me, completely unplanned, yeah. only happens once, I couldn't have scripted that, and lots of other things that happened, he had to just be fiercely connected to me in front of the camera. And similarly, the sound, sound recordist, I mean, what was really important on that shoot was that we were grabbing uh, wild sound and foley, we were, we were doing everything all the time because of course, I didn't want to recreate um, a lot of that. I wouldn't be able to have money for that. And also, the sounds were so specific to those places. So I had to make sure all that was happening, that I had all the tools I would need in post-production to make this film work. And at the same time, I'm playing a character that is so out of it. Yeah. 
uh, it was really, really challenging. And I relied on my daughter a lot to tell me because sometimes I didn't know where to pitch things because I, I didn't know how much I would play with the structure and the editing. So I would often reshoot things two times. So a Skype call with my son, would we, I shot late at night uh, at, a, at a very sort of low key tone after she'd gone to the dance club in Berlin and then she came back and she was so desperate for some connection. I shot a Skype phone call in that way and then I did a morning version because I didn't know where I'd play it. Yeah. Or a scene with um, the daughter, the intercut phone call scene, I shot a way when my character would be very emotional and another way where she'd be really dry. I just was never sure, self-directing, where I needed my character to be. So I had the luxury of shooting it two ways. And mostly, I intercut. I intercut both ways in the end. So specifically, the phone call with my daughter, it's playing along at this level. And then at the very end, there's a shot of my character, and I, she breaks down and cries. Well, the crying moment was from shooting it on that day, and the rest of the scene was from shooting it you know, three days later. So I'm taking actual shots. From, mo from the same scene shot maybe a week apart. And, and Ruby's greatest success that happens in the film is kind of ironically a performance art piece and not a film even. Uh, the film, the headshots film? Yeah, well I'd say like even just like uh, it comes out of promoting the film, but it's yeah. only, it becomes like a kind of performance art. Yeah. And, and that is like, that leads to that magic moment with the, the soldier. The, yeah. the, all of the real connections that exist in, in the spontaneity as opposed to the kind of rigorous ordering around. Yeah, and that's, you know, I mean, we make these independent films, and the point is to get them in front of an audience. And I know when I had the week release at Modra, I worked for, I worked for those hundred people in the house every night for maybe three months. My parents in Slovak costumes on the streets with postcards. And you do get to the point where you feel like, I will do anything. <laughs> I will do anything to get people out to the movie theater. And it's just how... What would, you, what would you not do? And there was a point where my character Ruby is like on the streets, just like holding out the postcards, just saying, please come. And I think that when we make films, it's our sort of responsibility to do that. I think that the, someone used the word showmanship, but I think that responsibility to um, get people out by whatever means necessary, by every means necessary, in working with distributors or if you self-distribute, I don't see a lot of, like I see a lot of it online with social media, but I want to see like people on corners. So it was fun with my son and his friends getting into the I'm a good person, I'm a bad person signs during TIFF. And they would walk the streets from TIFF Bell Lightbox to the AMC and all the areas, you know, all the theaters during the Toronto International Film Festival. And when I took a poll at the screenings, how many people are coming to see the film because they got a postcard from my kid? I'd say about 20% of the hands went up. So, you know, I've done that. That's a def if we're talking about an autobiographical element and I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, handing out postcards and trying to get people to the theater, I do that every single time. That's great. Yeah, so I'm a good person, I'm a bad person screening in New York at MoMA and in March, and I'm going to release it at the Royal in May. Okay. And I still only have, a, like, I have 230 Facebook friends. So if by May, my, get, my, my goal by May is to get to 500 friends. <laughs> it's not, like, no. too much to ask. No. Yeah. Are we good for the camera, then? I think is it done? No, we're still recording. Oh, I thought there were we five minutes left. Minutes. Yeah, do you need to go, Chris? I can oh, you need both. to go, time-wise. I had a few more minutes. 3 or 12? What time is it? 3.12. 3 12. 3 12. You need to go at 3.15? Uh, no, I can stay for like 10. Okay, yeah, sure. Because I had a few more questions. I was thinking maybe we can get the video. If there was an issue with the video, we'd... we'd no, the video's five. good. Okay. We're we still had, going. We'll do a podcast as well, a version of it, so we can always keep the audio. But I had a few, a few more questions about I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. One is the use of slow motion in that. There are like two, two very distinct moments where that, that technique gets used. And I couldn't really determine why. I think one was the carousel, uh, and there's another where I believe... The carousel's in Modra. Uh, no, am I thinking... Oh, I don't think in Modra. You're yeah. right, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's that and... But the train is an I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, where she's going on the That's train. That's right, yes. The carousel in Modra, so it's the train and I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, but there's also the divorce 
kind of conversation where it's all it seems it's also used if I if I remember it correctly. It's just intercut. It's just all jump cut. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So but that also does seem like the one moment that's completely out of the, the yeah the rest of the film. Yeah. Um. Well, I was really. I'm not gonna. I'll try and shorten the story, but I didn't know. I knew how to end. I am a good person. I'm a bad person. I knew it was her introducing the film and doing the confession. Yeah. Uh, which I did during an intro, um, and the audience thought I was completely nuts. Oh wow. Because no one knew I was going to say that, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the film that was screening. Um, so I had one shot to do that. I knew that was going to be the ending of the film, but I wasn't sure of how to get there. Yeah. And. Uh, so there was a half day in Berlin where I was trying to figure out what that step was going to be to, her, to, to trigger her confession. I did like this shower scene, you know, kind of cliche, naked in the shower where she kind of has a moment. Um, and then during breakfast, I wrote the scene where she's talking to her husband. And, you know, my two-person crew, my daughter, very, very incredibly patient, uh, were waiting for me to come up with an idea came up with a scene about the phone call, went to shoot it, yeah. shot a rehearsal, scripted it, you know, phone call, where Sarah, you know, Jake told me she's not with you, and then that whole say it, say it moment. Shot it one more time and said, this is crap. This is absolutely not going to be in the film. This is the wrong idea. This is not the trigger. This phone call to the husband is not the trigger to get her to the confession. So we scrapped it. So I had a rehearsal take, which only went halfway through the scene. And then I had one take where the focus was, you know, I mean, it's a handheld kind of moving shot. We thought we would shoot a lot more, but I had two takes. The only way to make the scene work was to in jump cut all, everything I had between those two takes. That was that. Because in the end, I wanted it in the film, so I'm jump cutting two takes. And um, the slow motion on the train was always something I wanted to do. Imag I originally imagined her bloody head wrap sort of falling down, um, but as I got rid of the, the head wrap earlier, it's the, you know, I mean, what does that shot feel like to you? Yeah, it's totally unstable. It's totally unstable. It's that feeling when you actually, I don't think she says one true thing in the whole movie. <laughs> And when she actually says something true, which interesting to, interestingly to me, everyone thinks is a lie. People think she's lying in that moment, that it's a manipulative moment. And maybe I shouldn't be saying that it's the one sincere moment she has because um, it's kind of cool if people think she's lying there too. But for me, in my mind, it's actually true. When what she says she actually means. And so when you've revealed yourself, you're completely raw and vulnerable. And that feels like you're gonna die. So that forward, the, the movement of the train and the tunnel and her walking through it in slow motion is completely that sus suspension at the same time going into what the daughter's ultimate decision is going to be, which kind of puts them connected. There's so many, you know, as a parent, you're always connected to your kid, whether it's conscious or not. So in a scene, for example, on the train where it's a close up of my eyes, just as, just as the daughter's getting a pregnancy test, they're completely connected. They don't know they are, but they are. And it's the same sort of idea with the slow motion on the train going into the daughter. There's a kind of interesting moment that also falls into this where I felt woozy, which was the conversation about Ruby potentially making a musical, where it seems like there's probably a million angles in that one conversation, like there's so many uh, cameras uh, positions in that in that short dialogue scene. And yeah, it's also very disconcerting. It's almost in a separate way because it's obsessive almost, right? Yeah, like kind of her going through like this grand scheme to pursue something that's like really ambitious. Yeah, I mean that was uh, that was a really really tough scene, um, and of course it was you know what do you do when you're film screening? Sometimes you go out for a drink and. She goes out with her daughter, and she's just so desperate for some validation. And I've always really wanted to make a musical, and I know I don't know if my daughter believes I can do it or not. But this is what I'm going to try to do next, just to prove it to her. But um, you know, that scene was really, really tough to find, 
and just the whole lying with the glasses yeah. moment and, and everything. Uh, we overshot, I mean, we didn't overshoot, but we covered that scene. Of course, we're only shooting one camera. It's almost all handheld. The whole film's natural light. We have like no film lights. This is like a way bigger setup than we had on the feature <laughs> with a way bigger crew, actually, because um, there's like five people in the room. Uh, but that scene we shot from many different angles, and then I just wanted it to be sort of voyeuristic and then go into some like conventional coverage. And I wanted it to almost feel, there's a lot of times in the film where I just wanted it to be, you, there to be an unsettled feeling. Um, and that goes, takes us into the Q&A for the screening, which is an unsettled feeling with like one person left in the audience and the other person sleeping. So I like that you felt a bit woozy. That's fantastic. Yeah. That was the goal. So it's going to be a musical the next one? That's the goal? Yeah. The, I, I'm co-writing a script that I'm really excited about, and it's, um, it's going to be lo-fi musical. Uh, that's um, a kind of fantasy lesbian love story road trip that starts in St. John's, Newfoundland and ends in Whitehorse. I'm going to film festival in Whitehorse in February, so I'll be scouting some locations. Oh, okay. Yeah. That'll be interesting to go back to, like, again, recreating the images that you've personally dealt with when, when you're there. Yeah, I was in St. John's at a film festival in October. I'm going to Whitehorse, so now when I'm in those places, I'm going to be in that sort of altered state of, you know, seeing things that I could actually put into a movie. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, yes. thanks for doing this, Ingrid. Okay, my pleasure. Okay. Good. Yeah. I thought there was like a camera malfunction. <laughs> no, 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 I no, just no. thought uh, we had a deadline. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm Is leaving that, that in too. It's gonna add to <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask. Yeah, that's like that's exactly the moment of the announcements coming in. Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. That sort of like we're in it. We're doing an interview, and then you're being really distracting, and then you're talking to him, and then we break the interview, and we 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 converse with each other, and we go back to the interview. But that moment in between the interview and that. That's what I want my films to be full of, those mm -hmm. moments. Yeah. I think we genuinely will probably leave it in, oh, right? Yeah, that's what we want, yeah. too. So that's what we're going for with this, too. <laughs> yeah, because the thing about that is it's actually an honest moment. And you want to... It's really, really hard to get those, like to actually create a space where... You know, I mean, you've created a comfortable environment. So to, to create a comfortable environment where... I can say, you've got five minutes, mm -hmm. and then you react, and then you guys have a conversation. It comes from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And when you're working, I mean, I just feel like there's so much uh, over, over, I don't know, maybe over uh, attention, too much attention on all the mechanical and technical aspects, and the atmosphere for creating those moments doesn't, doesn't exist. And everybody is so, wants to just, well, on the one tip, execute the plan, but on the other tip, not be a fool. Like, mm -hmm. not be stupid or make a mistake or, yeah. Or, yeah, kind of mess up yeah. or be wrong yeah. or get in trouble. Or, and I'm talking on film sets where it's a big crew and there's a lot of pressure and if you mess up, everybody goes, oh, like that. But it kills creativity. It actually kills creativity. Yeah, and when I've, as an actor, when accidental things have happened, um, you know, Brando always tested the directors, like he'd do a really bad take, well, what in his mind would be a bullshit take, and, on a, and a true take. And if the director couldn't see the difference, he'd, he'd walk through the whole movie. Like he'd just call it in, he wouldn't invest himself. And my meter is, if something happens that's spontaneous and accidental, and if the director cuts, I know it's going to be a dog. <laughs> I know the film's not going, it's not going to have any magic in it. Mm -hmm. Because the director's going after something specific, and they're not receptive and open to those other things. Like if, if, uh, if I spilled the beer, right? If I got, if I got up by accident and, I, and the beer crashed on the floor and the director cut, I would be like, I, that would be the worst thing to do. And that happens so often. We would leave that in. For but sure. it's the moment of the of it's the moment of like, oh shit, and looking in the camera and going, oh god, I'm really sorry. Like all of that, the really awkward stuff. 
So in Modra, when um, when he gets the guy gets up from the table and he hits his head yeah, on the thing, yeah. that that really happened. And then he got up and he knocks the beer onto the ground. And of course, I did get a really lame insert of the glass. But the point was that as you, it was because that's then a contrived moment mm -hmm. to try and capture the accident moment. The real point was that he got up, he knocked the beer over, the glass shattered, and everybody's reaction was, Genuine. yeah, tabernacle, you know, <laughs> one glass less and all that. Mm -hmm. Completely spontaneous, but an absolute accident, you know. And he felt horrible. And, and every time he then he got, what happens is then ac they turn the accidental moment into a repeated moment. But then that, the fake bumping the head was never good. No. You can't, you know, he would bump his head each time he got up after that, but that the accidental time is the time. So anyways, that's, you, by creating an atmosphere, you're, I think it's one of the most important things to do. Yeah, we've got this pretty comfortable at this point. Mm -hmm. Let's kind of get up and go. Yeah. And just do it. Yeah, and I don't know why it doesn't exist more on film shoots. I guess, you know, when you hear about the Blue Valentine shoots, or you hear about different independent films, you, you hear the actors talking a lot about the process and the atmosphere. Um, and it's, it seems like it's an easy thing to create, but it's, I think it's really, really hard. And I think a lot of people operate under the specter or the shadow, rather, of someone like Kubrick, when it's like, this is how a director behaves. Like, they're right. precise and they, they'll make you do that take 80 times until you get what the marks they want. Yeah, and I think it's a real battle. I mean, I'm constantly battling and I'm getting better at it. It was really hard and only, really hard in Modra, and a little bit better, and I'm a good person, but I think partially because I was on camera. The, um, that balance, which you know, of insist, like getting the thing that you know has to be in the film, in the way you've envisioned it. So making, like getting to the, it's not 80 takes for me, but it could be 11, 12, 15, 17, at, to the point where I'm just giving the actor a line reading because I, it has to be that way, versus letting go of the way that I imagined this, this happening for a year, letting go of it entirely, and embracing the new thing that might be something completely different. When to do that? Because you can't abandon and surrender every time, but you can't hold on and and force every time. Mm -hmm. And it's the dance yeah. that is, it's gauging when and how as a director in the moment, instantly. You don't have a moment to go like this, especially the way we shot I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, which was on the fly. We might only have one take, we might have two, police might come, we might not get anything. So there was no time to sort of think about it. Mm -hmm. It had to be spontaneous of when to hold on, when to let go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a, a non-making question, which is uh, you're producing Peter Mettler's yeah. film. Yeah. How's that? I love it. I think it's his best work ever. Because I think he's absolutely amazing and yeah. like probably better than most filmmakers of like the same period that a lot of people do gravitate towards. So he's a huge influence for yeah. me in terms of he works incredibly in in, in a very intuitive way. And of course, he's doing very lyrical documentaries. But yeah. I've I've adapted everything I've learned from him in the last twenty years of working with him into fiction. Yeah. yeah. And he's a big mentor. And this film is called The End of Time. Everything begins now. Oh wow! It's When's the cool. release? We're hoping to have it ready for Cannes. Oh, cool. Yeah, May. He, we're sound editing right now, and it'll be definitely. If for some reason we miss that, which is possible, um, then we'll definitely be ready for TIFF. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Venice, maybe like a European festival before, but TIFF for sure. How is his reception uh, globally? He's, well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I was in Florence last year. There was a big retrospective of his films at the Pompeii yeah. Film Festival. Um, he's had lots of retrospectives. I was at the tip one. Right, that was like yeah. Four years ago, five years ago. Yeah, he's had them all over the world. No, I think he's really respected. I think from, you know, from Cesare and the early days, of, and then, you know, lensing other people's films, like yeah. manufactured landscapes and whatever. 
Uh, but this film, it's gonna be, yeah, it's way more, I think, personal, uh, urgent, uh, accessible, uh, it's bolder, braver, um, way more, I don't know, just juicy than Gambling Gods and LSD. Yeah, well, I love like his kind of more, uh, well, how the reverent films, like with the, the top of his head. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think there should be a re release of because I oh, think yeah. it was ahead of its time. Definitely. I don't think people knew what to make of that film, but I think if it came around again, if like we just, if we just say it was made by someone else and we say it was <laughs> made in 2012, I think the film would be a huge success. Yeah. Yeah, but nice to meet you. You too. See ya. Thanks. All right. Ciao.